Hi, I'm Colleen Hutchinson. I'm here with John Morton and Jaime Ponce. We are at the 2017 Minimally Invasive Surgery Symposium at the Wynn Encore. And uh, we're going to go over a couple of different things here. First, let's talk a little bit about the balloon. So Jaime, can you give us a brief overview of the three current balloon options? Yes, so there, there are three different balloons that are being used for patients with moderate uh, to mild obesity BMI, so 30 to 40. One is a single balloon filled with saline. The other one is a double balloon filled with saline. Both of those balloons are placed endoscopically and removed endoscopically and stay there for six months. Mm -hmm. And then there is a new balloon that is gas filled um, that is being swallowed by the patient in the office. You have to swallow three balloons in three separate events and then remove it endoscopically. Okay. Um, what does the, what population does the balloon most benefit? Yeah, I think that the patients that get the most benefit are the patients that have lower BMI. And the FDA has approved these balloons for BMI, so 30 to 40. Okay. And so those patients that usually don't have a lot of medical problems, they usually are not ready for surgery or don't qualify for surgery, are the best patients that can fit for this. Okay, great. I think conceptually, you're going after people that have early stage disease. You take a page from cardiology, not everybody goes on to have a cabbage. Uh, some people just require a stint. And so in some ways, the intragastric balloons might be your stints. They might give us something in between medications and surgery. Um, and both Jaime and I have had experience after the FDA trial, uh, and we've been uh, very pleasantly pleased to see that the outcomes are even better than the FDA trial for, for reshape in, in one particular brand. So. Yeah, and remember, Colleen, these are patients that already have tried many diets, uh, they even in some cases have tried some pharmacotherapy and they have regained some weight. So the balloon, what it does, it just allows a good diet and, and lifestyle change program to work better. Mm -hmm. So they allow them to lose about two to three times more weight. Do you feel that primary care physicians know enough about this? No. To no, I think in general, public awareness, including primary care physicians, don't know enough about it. So we still have a lot of work to do with that. Okay. Um, can you speak a little bit to contraindications for any of the current devices and can you um, touch on the recent FDA warnings on pancreatitis and overinflation. Sure, yes. Yeah. So, so the balloons are basically contraindicated in anybody that has had previous gastric surgery, including a lap band, including any kind of uh, uh, nice and fund application, because the increase of stomach rupture is there, it's been proven. Uh, the other contraindication, anybody that has a severe uh, gastritis or ulcerations in the stomach, you don't want to put a balloon there because that can make it worse. Um, this recent FDA warning it's interesting, uh, very few isolated cases of pancreatitis uh, has happened with the fluid-filled balloons, both the single one and the double ones, but they're rare. I mean, occasionally, I can tell you that there are very few cases. The other one is this is spontaneous overinflation. It happens also extremely rare, and what happens, we think potentially is a contamination of a gas-forming organism that allows these balloons to expand and sometimes they cause more symptoms of obstruction and vomiting and discomfort that the balloon may require to be removed, but it is extremely rare. Okay. I mean, how many balloons have we placed now in the U.S., do you think? Um, I mean, I think we probably have placed a couple of thousand, three thousand maybe. And we're talking, how many FDA adverse events were there? Maybe three or four? Yeah, I think the yeah. cases of pancreatitis are less than five, you know, yeah. that's what we're talking about. Okay, so thank you for that perspective on that. Um, John, how about you give us a little bit of um, info on expected growth rate and number of procedures in the next few years? Well, I think, you know, bariatric surgery experienced uh, meteoric growth in, in the last decade. And part of the reason I experienced growth is because safety got better, efficacy got better, and I think the future is going to be continued growth, uh, probably not at the, uh, you know, double-digit rates, you know, 20, 30 percent. But I think we're looking at probably an incremental 5%, 10% growth rate each year. The reason I'm confident, I think, is because of a couple of things. One is I think there's going to be more public understanding about the disease of obesity and how bariatric surgery can work. And you can see that witnessed in all the New York Times articles out there. The second thing is let's finally get the House of Medicine to come in and give us a hand here because most of these patients are coming in to uh, see us on their own. Mm -hmm. But can you imagine if we get the cardiologists working, the orthopedic surgeons working, even the endocrinologists. DSSS, the consensus statement, I think will play a role in the future. I'm really very confident that the orthopedic surgeons will come on board. First of all, there's a need. 
if you have a BMI over 40 and you put in a joint, your risk of infection goes up fourfold. The longevity of the joint goes from 30 years to 10 years if you're obese. Wow. They have a clear and present danger with obesity that we can address. The other cool thing about it is culturally, we're alike. They're surgeons, we're surgeons. They get it, and this is the ultimate prehab, is to get patients blood sugar controlled, their weight controlled, their sleep apnea better, blood pressure, and we'll also hopefully do the same thing with our cardiology colleagues. They have the same sort of issues around heart failure, where there's a lot of readmissions. There's data now to show that when we operate on those patients who are sick with their heart disease is that we can improve it with bariatric surgery. And there's an old saying, but it's a true one, the weight of the heart is through the stomach. So we can, we can help these folks. Yeah, I think as a summary, you know, we have everything in place to grow. You know, we have achieved safety on the procedures. We have the centers of excellence or accreditation centers that enable us to have all the safety measures. We have work and inform the uh, primary care physicians as well as other specialties about the benefits. Uh, we have uh, made it so safe that patients should not be afraid of it. We just need to transmit that message a little bit better to the public. I think fear is still a big issue with mm -hmm. some patients. You know, they may have access, mm -hmm. they may have the referral from the physician, but still the fear is there. And so I think with time, uh, it's going to get better and it's going to grow. Yes, because ASMBS just completed that study with Newark that showed that many of our population are aware of the risks associated with obesity but they just don't have enough awareness about surgery to understand that that's actually a very safe option for them, correct? Correct, and it's very interesting. So the patients in general, or people in general, they're very afraid of surgery, but then ask the surgical patients how they feel about surgery after the surgery, and they all feel great. You know, more than 90% are satisfied with the surgery. So that message needs to be transmitted more and more. And such a high percentage of people who qualify for surgery have said through that study that uh, their primary care physicians, all clinicians, have, have never brought up surgery to them as an option. Yeah, I think there's more and more recognition of obesity's big problem in that survey. It was ranked at the same level of concern as cancer. Yes. But, you know, we still need to translate that into action. And to the safety standpoint, you know, bariatric surgery has never been safer. The mortality rate's equivalent to hip or knee replacement or removal of a gallbladder. Um, so the time is now, and I always say, why wait, you know, when you have an option that can help you? Um, and I really do think that we'll see more of society interaction, you know, through Jaime's work and Nin's work. We were able to put together the Obesity Summit, and we brought together 35 different societies. And a byproduct of that is we now have uh, guidelines that have been developed with orthopedics. We have guidelines that have now been developed uh, with reproductive medicine, and we plan on doing that across the entire fields of medicine. And this has overflowed tremendously. 2017 ADA guidelines mm -hmm. clearly have a whole chapter about how bariatric surgery is recommended on patients with obesity and diabetes. Mm -hmm. 